Let's start out considering what yarns are appropriate for passips. All of these are. This is 224, an industrial weight. The rest of these would now be presently described as from number 0 to number 2. Formerly that would have been called lace weight, fingering weight, and sport weight. And while sport weight is okay, only for single bed work and better for advanced users. It's getting a little bit thick for the passive. This would be okay. This is Knit Picks fingering weight sock yarn. And although coned yarns are really preferable because they feed so nicely, if you rewind this nicely into a cone or an easy to unwind ball, that will work. But for beginners, I strongly suggest number one acrylic yarn. The one I really think is great is Astracryl 3-ply from TAM. It hardly ever fails and it will do both single and double bed work nicely on the passive. Here's a blue yarn has been added to our collection and it's a major no-no. It's perfectly nice yarn and you wouldn't think of it as thick. It's not an artisan yarn or really bulky, but it is a number four yarn. This is actually the low end of number four. Things like Red Heart Super Saver are also number four and are substantially thicker and stiffer than this. It is not going to knit on your passive worth anything. It will only cause you pain and sorrow. Now let's look at strippers. These are an unusual feature of passive machines. This one is actually red, but they're called orange. These are really old ones. The newer ones are, in fact, orange. Some of them are only partly orange, with some of the parts being white. They are for almost all double bed work. If doing double bed work with a lot of tucking or something that needs a little bit of extra push downward, the blue are nice. They are not an absolute necessity, and Passive quit making them before they quit producing, but that's what they're for. Black is for single bed work, but take note. These aren't alike, are they? This is the old style. This is the new style. You will see me use this on a pinky, but I'm using it with green locks. Green locks are newer. My old pink locks wore out the rails underneath them, which is the subject of another video. And I had to change locks because I couldn't get them replaced at that time. So now I can use these, but they are too aggressive in their pushing for the old pink locks, and they grind. These produce the most push down, pushing the stitches down off the needles to the fabric. These produce almost as much, but not quite as much, and fit better on the old pink machines. Although, theoretically, you could use these for lots of knitting, if you try it, you will find it is very, very hard going. Not very good for you, or the machine, or the yarn, or the strippers. So, lighten up to one of these. You're going to see a little dust and debris on my pass up here. I'm not proud of it. Please forgive me. It's due for a cleaning. I want to show you the edge springs. In almost all use, they should be positioned over the last needle in use with the latch on that needle closed. I just opened it. Close it. Put it into normal working position. make it press down on the closed needle. The row counter tripper is usually hooked up under the spring on the left. The one on the right is positioned the same as a mirror image, but it doesn't need anything under it. The function of these springs is to keep those edge stitches knitting off neatly. You can manage without them, but they really are a big help. The strippers go in these brackets. Below each needle, there is a pusher. We don't use them for stockinette or anything that uses in. 
dx or cx. So right now, I would not need to use them. But for pattern knitting, they will produce automatic patterns by coming up and down. We're not going to go into to that much detail in this video. We're going to do some just getting started. That will be for future videos. Since they are not going to be used right now, they should be as you see them. This is called their rail, and they should all be hooked down in it. I'm moving the rail to and fro. In this position, if I had a free hand, I could bring the pushers up. When I let it go, they're trapped, and that's how they should be. You won't be able to see the carriage as well once I start knitting, so I'm going to go over the settings before I do. Most of the time, we cast on double bed in passive knitting and change to single bed. That works very well because we can either knit a double hem that we call a circular hem. It's two layers of fabric, but they're flat, not rimmed. Or we can knit ribbing, and either one of them starts well like this. In, a small stitch size, usually one, and we'll knit across, creating the zigzag row. Right now, I could not do that because my needles oppose perfectly. And if they all came out, they would crash into each other. Kabam. See them? Don't want that. So we rotate this racking handle that's on the left lower part of the machine. Now if you come with me over to the needles, you can see that they alternate. Now they can all come out without crashing. And that way we can knit our zigzag row. The yarn will zig and zag from one needle to the other, and that will leave a literally zigzagged row of knitting. But that knitting would not hold anything. So we change to C X, which is the circular or tubular setting. On that setting, one carriage will knit one direction and one the other direction. I'm going to look over the back here and you'll see the same settings appear on both carriages. Pass it pink and green locks are the same front and back. So you can get exactly the same settings. Usually the same stitch sizes will match too. So we will knit two rows set like this. Sometimes you can leave it on one. Very often on this particular machine I move up to two or three. I find one is a little tight. And for all of these rows I will use the orange strippers. Remembering mine look red, but we call them orange strippers. Then we go back to in, in, in front and in back and knit one final row across and the cast on is complete. From there, if I want to go straight to stockinette, I can do so. I can transfer all the stitches from one bed to the other and either bed may be used. I usually transfer front to back and actually use the back bed as the main bed, but it's perfectly fine to do it the other way. That's just a personal thing with me. Or we could knit, knit one purl, one ribbing from there. Or instead of knitting that end row, we could keep on in CX and knit that tubular hem. I'm going to do all those for you. But I will be saying these things, you won't necessarily be able to see the locks. In case the term lock is new to you, it means carriage in passive talk. It works best to place your yarn cone on the floor behind the machine because it'll flow freely that way. Then we want to go up and through this yarn guide. You'll get a cleaner look at what I'm doing if I put this masthead in the chair. Tensioner. Next we go through the eyelet, then we pull down what my husband calls the bug head. The yarn goes through there, and very last it goes through here. 
then into the feeding eyelet that sits in the lock. Here it is correctly threaded through the eyelet. If you feel it feeling rough or snagging, it is possible on old eyelets to get worn places on the inside of them. So you may have to use a round file. Don't just randomly do it. You don't want to alter it if you don't need to. But if you routinely have trouble with it shredding yarn, that is a possible way to save it. This eyelet is now correctly in the jaws. But it's possible to get it in the jaws so it clicks into place and sounds right, but is not right. It will not knit like that or any similar position. It must be just as seen here. Where most people mess up is not going down a checklist before they start. Correctly threaded, the yarn drops from the pass down between the beds. In my case, I've anchored it over here. That's not actually ideal, but I needed to do something, and my original anchor is having some problems. N, N, both beds on N. One, one, both beds on stitch size one. We're on C also, but when the lock is set on N, it will ignore C. There are buttons down here. Hit the zeros. We don't need them doing anything. There's only one on this side of this lock, and the back lock also has one. The beds are racked so that the needles will alternate. Each edge clip is correctly positioned, and my needle rule has been broken, so let's fix that. Most passive knitting requires that we follow something called the needle rule, which means that the last needle on the left should be on the front bed, the final needle on the right should be on the back bed. There are occasions when we willfully break that rule and it works fine, but it knits best like this for the majority of normal knitting. Orange strippers in place. One more thing. All the needles should be in regular position. The passip will not knit back from hold. And you should make sure they're straight. I'm going to straighten mine with my fingertips. It's also recommended that you can run the locks back and forth. Okay, let's knit across. Here's something that can go wrong and did. I did not make sure that my stripper was not going to get caught on the loop of yarn that came across. That's a matter of positioning. We'll see if I caught it in time to fix it when I get across. You can see my zigzag row, but you can see that because of my mistake, it did not work right. So I'm going to undo that, but I'm going to leave it in the film because it does happen, and you'll possibly need to know how to deal with it. Make sure that yarn is passing under the stripper and not going to get caught on the blade. Ready for our zigzag row. And that is just what we wanted to happen. Make sure that every row you completely pass this. We're already on C. Flip to X. And knowing my machine, I'm going to increase the stitch size a little now. And I'm going to do this on both beds. Two CX rows. One, two. Now I can go back to N on both beds. You can see what it did. And we're ready to knit back on in and close that cast on. That row will be stiff. That was not abnormal. At this point, if I want to do ribbing, I'm reaching down to the left to my racking handle. And I'm bringing the needles to exactly oppose one another. Now I can transfer some to the front and some to the back so we can get knit one purl one ribbing. 
I wish you could see how I've got my camera prop to do this. I hope it stays put. This is the usual way we transfer to every other stitch. Knit one, knit one, knit one, purl one. I'm going to take every other one from the front bend, my double eye transfer tool, remove that stitch from its original needle, flip the tool, seat it on the exactly opposite needle because I racked them so they oppose, and work like that across. I'm going to do the same thing going back to front so that each needle, this is only getting moved out of my way, I'm going to put it back where it belongs, each needle will eventually have two stitches on it for the first row of the ribbing. Like that. And because I'm at such an awkward angle, I'm going to do this stitch with you and then not try to make sure this keeps Still, I'm going to do the rest of the transferring off camera. Okay, ready to go, and I have a confession to make. I was concentrating so much on showing you these transfers, I forgot the needle rule, and off camera, I moved things back and forth a little more, so that again, my leftmost needle on the front, my rightmost needle on the back. Now, I've disturbed the edge clips while transferring, so I need to put them back on making sure that the needles are closed, not open. I'm over here to the right fooling with the locks where you can't see, and I'm increasing to stitch size 3-3. Three, three. And now we still are going to use these pink strippers and just knit. The first row will be stiff because everybody's holding two stitches. And it's stiffer for me than it will be for you because I'm working around the camera in an awkward position. For most projects, an inch of ribbing is the absolute minimum. And that's what I'm knitting. Two inches or three inches is more common. But of course, it very much depends exactly what you're doing. We would not usually use near as much on a neckline as we might on the hem of a sweater, and not as much for an infant as we would for an adult. My ribbing is finished, stitch size 3 seemed to work. I'm going to show you another way to transfer. We're going to transfer now for stockinette. We're going to use my favorite, because I'm making the video, which is to work on the back bed as the main bed. Here is a little trick for you. If you do not like the double eye transfer tool, otherwise known as the double end bodkin, or a double end needle, or a double eye needle, this is a teeny weeny crochet hook with a little bend in it that also makes a good tool for picking up and moving. So, in order to save myself stress, I will finish this off camera and come back to you when we're ready to knit stockinette. Now in order to knit stockinette, which is single bed knitting, we want to use the black strippers. You may wonder why I did not put them in for those two circular rows, because we were knitting one bed at a time. And had I been going to do it long, I would have done so. But for just those two rows, there was still too much of the zigzag up here and it would have been a binding, tough situation. Now, there's no longer anything on this front bed for the edge clip, so I just put it in a channel so that we will have this correctly positioned and make sure I knit past the row counter, which you must always do. You don't actually have to change the position of the lock, the setting on the lock, but you should change it to GX. That's in the manual, and that means free pass, and it can't possibly knit. The reason you don't have to is that if everything is working right, these can't come up. They really shouldn't. First row is the trickiest row, because you can see, if I get a tool, these stitches that are recently transferred like to pop up. But that's what the push of the black strippers is all about. 
So let's give them a chance to do their job. And voila. I emptied this needle. It had a ribbing stitch that... No, I don't know. I just accidentally put that into work, I think, while I was transferring. It shouldn't be in work, so I'm going to make sure it's pushed out. It was up there. It tried to catch a loop. Don't let that happen to you. It is not a disaster if it does, but it's going to make quite a messy edge. The woman that I bought this machine from years upon years ago, and it was already old then, told me something. I was having some trouble, and I called her. And she said, how fast are you knitting? This is not a minute waltz machine. This is uh, the Blue Danube. So if you know music at all, you'll realize she was telling me to measure my pace a little better. I was knitting too fast. And the spring can't spring back and control the loop of yarn that would otherwise form here. And the needles can't get their latches closed in time if you go too fast. Plus, you'll wear yourself out. I'm going to break my yarn and drop the sample off for us to look at together. I just estimated good stitch sizes, but it looks like I did pretty well. You will always get this ruffling at the edge of that kind of cast on until you clean it up. I'm not going to be able to do a full clean up here, but what you do is run a thread or a wire through it where I'm running the tool and give it a hard lengthwise pull. With some yarns you need to block it, but see the difference already even doing part of the job? So if you don't love the edge of your rimming, that's probably all that it needs. Now let's do basically the same thing, but knit a tubular or circular hem. I have gone back to stitch size 1, N, N, the setup where I have needles on both beds up and they're racked so they won't crash into each other. Red, well, orange strippers. And we'll knit our zigzag row. And it did beautifully. Now I'm turning to X and X. Whoops, I had that front set on CX. You can only adjust this dial in the end position. So I flipped back to N on the left, then I was able to move this, now back to X. Moving up to 2, knitting 2 rows. And actually, I believe the first one will knit on the back bed. Yep. Second one will knit on the front bed. Now, that's going to be my cast on. We're going to go straight into the tubular hem. There's only one thing I want to do. Let's go over here and rack so the needles oppose. Don't panic because we're going to keep knitting tubular. So they won't crash into each other. They're only going to come out one set at a time. I'm coming back over. I'm changing to stitch size 3. Typically, you want your tubular hem just slightly tighter than your garment. So we'll see if 3 will do it successfully. I was knitting the main knitting on 4, if you recall. The reason is that if it's a little bit tighter, it doesn't flip out. And when it does flip out, you look like an idiot in the blouse. All right, I changed to black strippers. I'm still on CX, CX. The needles oppose exactly. Why it matters is because the edge will be neater if they oppose exactly. Then they'll, the yarn will make the distance across here. It won't have to go at an angle. So we'll get tidier edges. And if you were doing, suppose you're doing a tunic with a deep hem, and you're not going to hem all the way down to the bottom. You want it to have a slit in it. This is an easy way to do it, and it'll make a neat edge.
My first couple rows were tight. And I would say they're too tight. See me struggling? Obviously, stitch size 3 for stockinette is too conservative, so I'm going up to 4. Much better. Because basically, this is stockinette. The beds are knitting one at a time. Now, if I want a one inch deep hem, and I'm getting 10 rows per inch, you might think that of course I should knit 10 rows, but actually I should knit 20, because each time I move the locks, I'm only getting half a row. And the reason it's circular or tubular, there's now an opening down here. If I were going to move on now, this was my hem, and I'm going to knit a stockinette blouse or potentially a sock leg, or this could be the hem of a child's dress. I would again transfer all these over and do what we did the last time to transfer transition from the hem to the um, main garment. However, in this case, I just want you to see the hem, and that'll be the end of our work for today. What just happened there was me hesitating. You don't need to ever stop and even jiggle. And because I'm working at this awkward angle, I did that. And you see the results. I almost bent a needle. See, that looks exactly the same on both sides. And it's open on the top. So it would be closed if I had transferred stitches and gone on to plain knitting. So that is the way I get started with the majority of projects on the passive. One of these two things. And as I said, even though I'm going to knit in single bed knitting, usually we start with a double bed cast on, the one you've seen. So, quick review. Black strippers when knitting on one bed at, time, at a time, for any length of time. Orange when knitting on two beds at a time. Usually you match the settings on both beds for stitch size, very often for setting. GX means nothing will happen at all when you move the blocks across. CX means this carriage will knit one way, the other in the other way. For plain knitting, you do not need any of these arrow buttons engaged. The correct seating of the eyelet is very important, and the correct choice of yarn.